Mutations are an integral part of the Dead Cells experience. I've had a lot of requests asking me about how do I pick which mutations for every single run. How I like to imagine mutations is that if your build is the entree, then the mutations are your side dish. Ultimately, mutations can make or break a run. My name is Psyche, and welcome to the Ultimate Mutations Guide. So first of all, just to give out some general tips about picking mutations, this will be pretty brief. And then in the next section, and this will probably take up the most time out of the video, I'm going to review and analyze each and every mutations in the game up to version 2.3. A lot of you have been asking me to do a mutations tier list, and I'm afraid this is as close as it's going to get. And it's pretty clear that from my biomes guide, some of you weren't watching the quizzes sections. I'm not gonna do quizzes this time around. Without further ado, let's get into the first section. The most important thing to remember is that mutations function very differently from items and skills in the sense that there is no commitment. See, you can actually change your mutations anytime you want during transition areas. I know it's tucked away in a small box on top there, but you can reset your mutations. Although the cost of rerolling mutations will double every time you do it. So the first time it will cost 1,000 gold, and then 2,000, and then 4,000, 8,000, 16,000 and onwards. Generally speaking, you can probably reroll a maximum of four times, though I don't really have ever seen a scenario where that was the case. Usually I just reroll once or twice every single run. Speaking of rerolling mutations, I like to categorize my mutations loadouts to two different scenarios, one for biomes and one for bosses. So for biomes, you generally want something that's good in biomes, pretty self-explanatory. And then for bosses, because some mutations don't work as well, for bosses, you generally want to swap out your mutations for some really defensive options when it comes to bosses. And when I'm talking bosses, I'm really talking about the endgame bosses, such as the Hand of the King, the Giant, maybe even the 5BC boss. But generally speaking, you don't want to reroll your mutations for every single boss in the game. So I would say don't try to reroll your mutations if you're gonna fight Conjunctivious, because you're gonna have to reroll it back to something else, since you still have a lot of the run to go through. So sometimes you do have to plan ahead. For example, if you already reroll mutations twice, the next reroll will cost 4,000. So you have to make sure that you have 4,000 by the time you get to the next biome, if you want to reroll again. And lastly, there is no rule when it comes to picking mutations. For example, you can always pick mutations off color. There are no rules saying that if you're running Brutality, then you must pick red mutations. This is because in every single run, you are guaranteed to pick from the same pool of mutations as any other runs. So there is no RNG in this department compared to items and skills because you have to buy them from shops. You can get away with more experimentation here than anywhere else. For example, in my Ferryman's Lantern build, you'll notice that I picked two colorless mutations and then a survival mutation, even though I was running Brutality. So none of the mutations I picked lined up with my color. Because it was a new experience for me running the Lantern, I didn't really know what to pick, so I generally just followed my gut instinct and picked out things that I thought would really work out for me. The effectiveness of mutations do scale with how many scroll stats you have in your color, but it is not mandatory that you pick mutations that are the same color. With that being said, let's move on to my analysis of every single mutations in the game. So here I'm going to show the tier list, well the quote unquote tier list that I'm going to use. As you can see, there are only three sections now. They are the very viable section. This means that the mutation is generally good enough to be picked every single run. It's just a good mutation in general. You don't really need any synergy to work off of it, and it's something you can just pick because you're pretty much guaranteed to find it useful in every single scenario. The second category is the situational category. And here it's pretty self-explanatory. If the mutation only functions well in certain scenarios, then you will pick it. However, something that I wanted to be clear is that even though if a mutation is situational, it doesn't mean that it can never be as good as a mutation in the very viable tier. Sometimes, if you have the correct build, a mutation in the situational tier can be even more powerful than a mutation in the very viable tier. And finally, 
the last tier is the not viable tier. This means that you will rarely find instances where this mutation can be useful. Generally, they're just dead weight or just not very beneficial at all. Now, in a perfectly healthy meta, I would say every single mutation should fall into the situational category, since I don't think any of these mutations should be so weak that nobody uses them, but they also shouldn't be so powerful that they're picked every single run. So first of all, I'm going to start off with the colorless mutations, and then slowly work my way through every single color. So first off is YOLO. I believe this is unlocked right from the beginning of the game. It takes up a mutation slot, and even once you use it, you can't get rid of it for another mutation. And I think this is one of those traps that beginners tend to fall into. There is a better mutation that does everything that YOLO does, except it does it better, and that's Disengagement, which I'm gonna talk about later. The only reason I will run it is for getting the achievements, so I don't think YOLO is very viable. Recovery increases the amount of rally points you can get by 2. I've never seen anyone take this. I never take this myself. Maybe it's useful. I guess if you're sure that you can get a lot of rally points back, then it might be helpful. But again, I've just never seen anyone take this. So I would say it's just not viable. Next up is Velocity. The only instance where I would consider running this is if I'm running Swift Sword, because you actually benefit from having the speed bonus. And even then, I know that when some people play with the Swift Sword, they don't even pick up Velocity. I guess if you really like speed, you can pick it, even though I just don't pick this at all. Next up is Acceptance. This is another one that I never use, like I never even touch this mutation. I think this is also a beginner trap where you see the 50% reduction on the curses you have to lift, and you're like, wow, this is so good, except it's not. See, curses are already pretty situational to begin with. You're most likely to only take two or three curses every single game anyways, so already this is pretty situational. And really, just having to lift five less curses is not really too beneficial in my opinion. Just kill five more enemies, it's really not a big deal. And I've seen some people take this with alienation, so how this interaction works is that you originally take 15 curse instead, and then it gets divided by half. So I believe every time you pick up some food or you take a curse chest, you get cursed for 7 or 8 points. I never understood why people do this, because if you pick alienation, it actually benefits you from having to lift more curses because you heal up more. If you combo acceptance with alienation, not only are you taking up two of your three precious mutation slots, which can be used for something way better, if you put it that way, it's just not very worth it. Acceptance, also not viable. And finally, Dead Inside. Dead Inside used to be really, really good, and I think some people prefer this over disengagement. Some people just like to have the flat health increase, as opposed to being more defensive. I personally never use Dead Inside. The only scenarios what I think Dead Inside will be helpful is for boss fights, since you can generally take more damage before healing up. The problem is that on 5 BC, especially the 5 BC boss, you take so much damage from being hit, dead inside it just really doesn't matter. Like there's this one attack by the 5 BC boss, where if you get hit, under any scenario, it just drops your health down to 20% and proc disengagement. So the health bonus from dead inside really doesn't matter in 5 BC. Again, not very viable. Alright, let's move on to the very viable category for colorless mutations. First off is Emergency Triage. This, in my opinion, is a staple for endgame bosses. If anyone here's played Dark Souls or any Souls-like game, you'll know that you cannot just heal anytime you want. Since in those games, as well as Dead Cells, when you use the Potion Flask, there will be a small window where your character is vulnerable. But thanks to Emergency Triage, you can use your Health Flask whenever you want, I see that a lot of new players tend to stay away from this since they look at the health reduction that you get from healing and they think, oh man, 45% as opposed to 60? That's a huge downgrade. But trust me when I say this, if you look at almost all of my runs, I take it every single time for bosses. It's that good. If you pick this mutation before the Hand of the King fight, if you're struggling to beat him, I can almost guarantee you, you will find yourself getting further in that fight. Taking Emergency Triage before endgame bosses will almost surely increase your win rate. I don't really take it for biomes, and it's really for bosses where the timings are tight, where everything is going on so fast that you can heal up whenever you want, which is a huge bonus. 
Next up is disengagement. I think this is slightly more situational in the sense that you generally want to take this when you have very low health, such as with tactics. If you have like a double damage item, you can really benefit from disengagement. I think disengagement is one of those mutations where it really builds up your confidence since it turns you invulnerable once your health goes down to 20%. So if you're really practicing trying to stay aggressive on enemies, just pick up disengagement and you'll find that you can heal up a lot easier with it. And like I said before, I think this engagement just outranks YOLO in every single way possible. Finally, let's move on to the situational tier. First off is Masochist. It does exactly what it says, it's pretty self-explanatory. It is helpful in a lot of different scenarios such as practicing challenge rifts or certain biomes such as the distillery. It also works as barrel launcher if you're not confident with using that item. It does exactly what it says and it's really good at doing it, so... If you can find a scenario to use it, definitely go for it. Instinct of the Master of Arms. I think this is a very, very solid pick if you have a fast weapon that deals critical damage really quickly, such as Fire Blast, Repeater Crossbow. Obviously, it does technically work with any single weapon that crits, but you generally wouldn't want to pick this if you have something very slow like Broadsword. But overall, really good situational mutation, and luckily, it's actually unlocked right from the beginning of the game. Next up is ammo. The problem with ammo is that if you have a grenade that gets all your arrows back, just get that instead. The only scenario what I would pick ammo is when I actually need arrows and I don't have any way to get them back. And surprise, it actually works with the ferryman's lantern. You can store twice as many souls in the lantern as you would originally, so I guess that's also a use for it. Alienation increases the amount of curses you have to lift by 50%. However, I actually think this is one of the most interesting mutations in the entire game. I think alienation is a potential game changer. A big part of improving as a Dead Cells player is decision making. If you're running low on health, you can really take advantage of alienation, especially on higher BCs when health flasks are less available to you. Some people think it's bad, but it gets better the higher your BC level goes. Lastly, it's the newly added mutation from 2.3, no Mercy. I think this is good for fast builds in the early game, such as Magic Missiles, where a lot of the weapons really struggle with damage, and a lot of it only gets a lot better once you get into the late game. The interesting part about No Mercy is that in the late game, when you are already doing a lot of damage, the bonus from No Mercy is just kind of trivial, so I would say you can actually swap out No Mercy for something else. Which creates a really interesting dynamic on this mutation, in the sense that you generally want it in the early game, but for the late game, you can really just use something else. Okay, let's move on to Brutality. First off, we have Vengeance. The damage reduction from Vengeance used to be 60%, which was pretty big, and some people took it off color. Now it's just not very good. On the higher BC levels, you generally don't want to be hit at all, so I just don't see any reason to pick this. Next up, we have Adrenaline as well as Frenzy. I'm going to rate these two as a package. I almost never take these two mutations. I think this is, again, one of those traps that beginner players tend to fall into. When you're running Brutality, you don't need healing. A misconception for newer players is that they overvalue health. But the thing is, if I were to pick between these two mutations or something that just does more damage, I'm gonna pick the damage, like 90% of the time. If you think about it this way, if you kill every single monster before they even do anything, then you can never take damage. So if you put it that way, Adrenaline and Frenzy are just not very consequential. Tainted Flask. Now this is very very interesting because on 5 BC, the enemies spawned by the malaise actually counts towards Tainted Flask. Now, sadly though, it is capped at one heal, so it only triggers if your flask is completely empty. I think this really has potential. All they ne really need to do is make it so that you get a flask charge no matter how many heals you have left. But obviously maybe increase the elites you have to kill for it. But other than that, I don't really pick this mutation. Next up, we have Quirky Pack. This is probably the most underwhelming backpack mutation out of the three. I think it's not bad on paper, but the thing is, the sole reason where I would imagine I would pick this is if I wanted to put a single status effect on an enemy, 
So if I wanted to put bleeding on the enemy, I would put blood sword in the backpack. If I wanted poison, I would I would put snake fangs in the backpack. The problem is that the amount of damage uh, the porky pack does is just very, very trivial. And even if you wanted to put a status effect on enemies, just pick something else that does it better. Lastly, we have initiative. I think initiative is actually not bad. I did use it in my katana run since the dash just pretty much one shots every single mob in the biomes. The problem is that initiative is just outranked by some of the other picks on this list such as combo which I will get into later. So really, initiative isn't bad, it's just that so many other mutations does its job better, you really don't want it to take up one of your three mutation slots. With that being out of the way, let's move on to the very viable picks. First off, we have Open Wounds. Open Wounds is just very, very effective in general. If you have Bleeding Synergy, then it procs it instantly. And even if you don't have Bleeding Synergy, you can basically just pick Open Wounds, and it just does an overall increase of damage. And I would just pick it if I had nothing else to pick if I'm running Brutality. Combo is a mutation that's unlocked right from the beginning of the game. I think it's just a very, very generally a good pick since the damage boost from it is pretty substantial. And if you're just not sure, if you're not sure what kind of build you're going for when running Brutality, you can just pick up combo. I really don't have anything else to say, except it's just pretty good. Finally, let's move on to the situational stuff. First off is Scheme. Obviously, the only scenario where I would say this is useful is if I'm running skills with fast cooldowns such as Grappling Hook. But overall, nothing too much to say about it. If I'm running Grappling Hook or something like Phaser, I will pick up Scheme. Next up is Predator. The invisibility from Predator is actually pretty substantial because if you can time your attacks well, you can basically wipe out an entire biome without enemies noticing you're even there. One weapon that I found to be really effective with this is the Katana. Since all you have to do is dash while invisible, you kill an enemy, which turns you invisible once again, and then you just rinse and repeat. So Predator, I think you really have to think about what kind of build this belongs in, but if you can find a place for it, it's very, very effective. Much like Combo, Killer Instinct is also a mutation that is unlocked right from the beginning of the game. Again, this is pretty self-explanatory. If you have a very skill-oriented build, generally you will want to pick this up. Melee is a really, really aggressive mutation. I don't pick it often, but if you're running melee, you're probably not going to be running a shield. So if you think about the build that you're running, if you're very, very aggressive, then generally speaking, melee is pretty much staple because all you have to do is hit the enemy, and they can never hit you back. Melee is situational, but it can be very, very powerful. So there we have it for the brutality mutations. Let's move on to tactics. Now the general consensus on tactics is that it's ranged focused, and a lot of the mutations are very aggressive. So let's get started. Tactical Retreat. So I think this mutation just goes against every single essence of tactics. Um, it is a pretty good defensive option, but the problem is there are other mutations and tactics that just does its job better. And on top of that, slowing down enemies will mess up with your parry as well as dodging patterns. So it's just not very good. Generally for tactics, you really want something to boost your damage output. Speaking of damage output, Ripper is a very interesting combo you can do, especially if you look at something like the Shrapnel Axe. The problem with Ripper is that it's just not very consequential, because even if you get your arrows back from Ripper, it just still doesn't do enough damage to warrant its effect. And on top of that, it already requires you to run both a melee weapon as well as ranged, which is already pretty awkward to begin with. Parting Gift. Now this, in my opinion, is possibly the most powerful mutation in the game right now. If I'm running a ranged setup, I pick this every single time. It's that good. All you have to do is go into a biome, you kill one enemy, and then it just pops a bomb, and it just starts a chain reaction, and it kills everything else on the screen without you even doing anything. Obviously, you're gonna have to swap it out in bosses because it's just not good, but when it comes to biomes, Parting Gift is gonna be my premier choice if I'm running ranged. Next up is Barb Tips. This one's from 2.3 as well. And you must have seen my most powerful build in the game video. I think in the meantime, it might be even more powerful in Parting Gift. And I would say it's crazy if the devs don't nerf this. Really, I think it will get nerfed in the future because it's just too good at the moment. But we'll see how well that goes. Tranquility is a very interesting playstyle that it promotes. 
The only instance where I would use this is if I'm running something like the Marksman bow, the Barrel Launcher, or maybe the Quick Bow. If you saw my builds recently, I did run this with Marksman's bow with the War Javelin, since it synergized pretty well together. Tranquility is not a mutation that I pick every single game, but it is in the back of my mind every time I run tactics. Crow's Foot. So this is the mutation that I think outranks Tactical Retreat. Because melee tactics is just not a thing right now, Crow's Foot doesn't really see too much play. Since the 2.1 uh, color change, a lot of the melee tactics mutations got moved to Brutality. And Crow's Foot is one of the few that got left. Obviously, tactics melee is still possible. It's just that it's less viable than before. But if I'm running melee tactics, I would run Crow's Foot, because it's just a pretty good defensive option. So networking, I seriously debated about putting this in the not viable tier, since I did try to run it in videos, except it did work. Well, kind of. It's just that it's not very good. I've seen some people make it work before, and it does look pretty interesting. Like, networking can define a brand new playstyle. But personally, I just haven't found too much success with it. The only reason I put it here is that I wanted to make it be open for experimentation. If you guys can make networking work, definitely let me know. I would want to try this out. Next up is Acrobata Pack. Now the only instances where I will consider running this is if I'm running Hokuto's Boat or Alchemic Carbine, because I think these two are the best weapons to pair up this mutation with. As for anything else, I think if the scenario arises, Acrobatic Pack can be very useful. Overall, if you get Hokuto's Boat, there's just no reason for you not to pick up Acrobatic Pack, because this in the backpack is just very, very busted, especially for any DLT build. Ranger's Gear. So you saw me take this in a recent build with Point Blank. It's essentially free damage and it's really good for skills with fast cooldowns such as Phaser or Wave of Denial. Or if you have some way to have skill cooldown reduction, definitely pick this up. It's basically free damage. Point Blank. This was also introduced in the recent 2.3 update. I think it's pretty cool if you can make it work. The main weapons that I think of when I'm running Point Blank will be Infantry Bow, maybe Fire Blast, and even like Electric Whip can benefit off of this. It's pretty cool that they made it so that it's a percentage damage boost as opposed to just like a flat damage increase like from Ranger's Gear. Hunter Instinct. This is a mutation that's unlocked right from the beginning of the game. Again, just like Killer Instinct, it's just a very good mutation overall. If you're unsure of what to pick and you have pretty decent skills, you will want to pick this up. And lastly is support. Any type of double turret setup is extremely powerful because support actually boosts that damage by a crap ton. And it's very, very powerful in bosses. In fact, this is one of the few mutations that actually work better in bosses as opposed to biomes. If you have double turrets in your build, I would seriously suggest this mutation. Finally, we're gonna move on to survival. There are both melee as well as ranged weapons. And the emphasis on this color is slow and hard hitting weapons. Survival builds are given the most amount of health because they're prone to the most amount of error. So as a result, most of the survival mutations are pretty defensive. Soldier Resistance. It gives you a flat health increase and I believe it stacks up to 25%. It's really not bad, it's just not enough. Like it's not very consequential. Again, I've said this about that inside. It's just that on the later BCs, bosses and enemies do so much damage, the health increase from soldier resistance is just not very consequential. Okay, so next up, I'm gonna have a really, really controversial opinion. Um, I think every single shield mutation in the game, blind faith, counterattack, what doesn't kill me, and spite are all not viable. The only one of these mutations where I would put on the situational tier is what doesn't kill me. The problem with shields is that it's an offhand mechanic. It, you're not gonna go out of your way to parry an enemy if you can just kill it straight away. If you wanted healing, just pick up Gastronomy, which is a better mutation that I'll talk about later. If you wanted more damage, just pick some skill reduction or frostbite, which I'll also get into later. I just don't really see a reason to use any of these mutations. And I think they're just very outdated game design. I really hope they change these, to be honest. The only reason what doesn't kill me is put on the situational tier is because the skill cooldown reduction is actually kind of substantial when it comes to bosses, since for boss fights, you're more likely to be parrying a lot since they're tougher than most enemies. 
Necromancy used to be so overpowered, people picked this every single run. The problem is that it let you heal up to 100% of your health just for playing the game. Now it only heals to 50%. And on higher BCs, being at low health, even at 50% can be pretty dangerous. The only scenario I would consider running this is if I'm running Frantic Sword, but even that requires me to run this off color. I think if they buff this to 75%, then it might see some play. But for now, it's just not good. Extended healing. I think this is also one of those traps that beginners tend to fall into. They see that you heal up more when you use your health flask. It's just a pretty exciting idea. But the thing is though, when you heal in dead cells, you don't want to wait like 5 seconds for you to heal back up. You want the heal right now. And if you're going to wait until you have low enough health just to get the full advantage of extended healing, is just extremely risky. Like, I'm not going to intentionally lower myself until I have below 15% health just so I can benefit from extended healing. It's not good at all for bosses, actually. For bosses, you want the heal right now, and I would say emergency triage will be picked before this in every single scenario. Gastronomy might be the most powerful healing mutation in the entire game. I take this off color sometimes, I see other people take this off color sometimes, because you're always guaranteed to get double healing from food items. So all the small foods heal you for 30% of your health, and then the larger foods heal for 100% of your health. So if you put it that way, it's just very, very good. And if you have nothing else to pick, if, you have, if you're not sure about your build in the beginning of each run, just pick up Gastronomy. Frostbite might just be the survival equivalent of Parting Gift. I think it's the best survival mutation in the game right now. It's so good that every single survival build wants this. Like, you will be crazy to want to pass this up. Basically, all you need is the victim's slow down nearby enemies affix on one of your weapons. You pick up Frostbite, and then the small enemies, such as the Kamikaze Bats, just die like right in front of you. I do have this small footage where the buzz cutters just died before I even reached there because I killed some enemies nearby. This also works with ice shards which makes it one of the premier options to pick if you're dual binding ice shards with a solo melee weapon. It's so good that you're, you can basically pick this ahead of time and then just try to reroll your affixes to get the victim slowdown affix. Now you might be surprised that I'm putting Berserker in the very viable tier it's because the damage reduction from this mutation is actually very, very substantial. I believe it caps at 60% damage reduction. So if you look at the footage I'm showing in the background, if you would imagine how much damage this slasher would do to me, usually at 5 BC, it would generally put out like a quarter, maybe a third of my health. But as you can see, it actually decreased the amount I took by a lot. Like, that is very, very substantial. Obviously, its use is pretty limited in bosses, but if I'm running any type of slow survival melee weapon, I would seriously consider running Berserker. Heart of Ice is very, very good in a lot of different scenarios. Um, if you're running Seismic Strike, it just self-synergizes with itself since you're always hitting rooted enemies. If you're running Freeze, if you're running Rooting, you can get off a lot of skill cooldown if you just pick up Heart of Ice. Skill Rhythm is a mutation that was introduced in the 2.1 update. Um, it's very good with dual binding builds. You saw this with Broadsword. I was able to no hit the 5 BC boss for the first time when I dual binded Ice Shards with Broadsword because Kill Rhythm actually works in dual binds. And on top of that, it's very beneficial for a lot of the two handed weapons, such as Scythe Claws, Heavy Crossbow, or even the Ice Crossbow. Like, with the Ice Crossbow, you can actually pull off critical hits in bosses because you're firing the ammo fast enough that it actually hits the boss before the boss unfreezes. Kill Rhythm actually opens up a lot of interesting possibilities for builds, and I think it's a potential game changer. And last but not least, we have Acrobata Pack. The only reason I'm putting it here is because I think this and Cocoon go head-to-head. -head. Uh, Armadillo Pack usually has a cooldown when you parry with it, but it doesn't have a cooldown if you roll away bombs and projectiles. So in the Hand of the King fight, when he throws the bombs out at you, you can just roll once and it gets rid of all the bombs instantly. I think Armadillo Pack really comes down to personal preference, but if you ask me, I would rather have a shield in my offhand than in my backpack. But that's just my opinion.
But other than that, that's gonna be it for the mutations guide. Hopefully you have found this guide helpful and taught you a lot about how mutations work, which ones are better, and how you can pick them throughout your runs. With that being said, if you enjoyed this tutorial, definitely leave a like. I post Dead Cells content on my YouTube channel in the form of guides as well as 5 DC gameplay runs. If any of that interests you, make sure to subscribe to the channel. That's going to be it for me today. Hopefully, I'll put out a 3 BC guide sometime in the future, and then I'll move on to 4 slash 5 BC guides. So until then, thanks for watching, guys.